Hello everyone, this is TN Politics with Maya and I'm Maya, nice to see you, nice to have you with us one more week. Finally, we have a man as a guest. <laughs> Hello I, Maya. I didn't consider that uh, when I was doing the introduction, but I've had only women so far as okay. guests. So you will have to make a very good impression to our listeners. <laughs> no, no stress there. <laughs> no pressure yeah, at no all. No pressure. Yeah, well, so today we have uh, Piotr with us, Piotr Sadowski, who is one of the few very fresh faces which I met in the beginning of when I moved to the EU bubble. And I'm very happy that uh, today we have you with us. So this is a space where we dissect power and empowerment, okay. leadership, management. And I think that you have a lot to share on all of those topics uh, based on your experience. Mm -hmm. I know you have a very rich career so far and there is, of course, uh, more to come. But let's start from the start. Okay. I always like to ask this question, how the hell did you end up in the position that you're at right now? Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Maya, for having me. And seriously, when I actually didn't realize that I'm the first man to be on your <laughs> on your video cast as well. So yeah, I, I promise not to feel any pressure whatsoever. But <laughs> I'll try to do my best. Um, I'll do a quick recap of uh, what happened in my life, really, because something at the age of, I think at the age of 16 happened to me, which probably has had a ma major impact of, of on where I am now and mm. why I'm here. Um, I come from Poland uh, at the age of sort of 15 going on to 16, where I was in my secondary school in Poland. Um, we found out that uh, the United World College Movement, UWCs, uh, were going to run another round of recruitment to their schools, uh, which are placed all around the world. Um, and I applied for a scholarship uh, for, for one of these schools to basically and to try to go there to discover, to discover oh. basically when I found out that these schools, so you can just imagine me and I think you'll relate, you know, coming from central Eastern Europe, um, living in a very homogeneous society, mm -hmm. uh, basically nothing is different. And even if you're different, you're, you cannot say that you're different because mm -hmm. you'll be very quickly ostracized. We're talking about, you know, 1996 around this time. Um, I found out about the, you know, uh, the UWC movement, about uh, the, the ethos of the schools where international understanding is the absolute principle that drives everything, drives your education, your interactions, your relationships with other people. The fact that these schools bring together young people from all over the world and mostly on merit as well mm -hmm. was something right. I said to myself, right, I'm going for this. Um, and I was lucky enough. I, I, I got a scholarship. I went to a place called Atlantic College, uh, which is in the south of Wales in the UK. Um, and yeah, I went there when I was 16. I left there when I was 18 and made, wow. um, and I lived really with people from, um, of my age, my peers from all over the world, we followed the International Baccalaureate Program, but also what was important about it is that the IB has a, a very important element of it is this uh, focus on community service, mm -hmm. on volunteering. And so I jumped coming from Gdansk in Poland, so the Baltic Sea and everything. There was We had a lifeboat station for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, so I volunteered to be a crew member with the lifeboats. So really I was filling my my those normative years of my my life 16 17 18 with education living a lot of partying as well with with my <laughs> friends from all over the world Partying is a yes. defining moment in your exactly life. Okay. exactly and for me it happened when i was 16 17 not when i went to university by the time then i went to university i did my party you were already basically. boring yeah. yeah same yeah exactly so no so basically uh, long story short because of the fact that i was exposed to this amazing gift of um being surrounded and learning from people from other cultures but also being there, f um, having other people around me, if it was tough for me, they would surround me and help mm -hmm. me equally. If my friends, my colleagues were there, they didn't have to be my friends. They could, they were just my peers as well. If they had problems, you know, it was an open space. And, and you would be there. Uh, yes, them. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And also being there in a place which was so um, absolutely open minded and even more encouraged you to be yourself. It felt like a right space for me to come out as well at the age of 16. If I thought that this would ha this would not happen if I stayed back home in Poland in a also very good secondary school, but it was just impossible. You know, you had mm -hmm. to sort of to uh, tag along the lines of that's how things are uh, have to be. 
-hmm. And there's really something like this, like your sexual orientation as well. Just you just don't speak about that, basically. Mm -hmm. So for me to be in a place like this really then impacted on where I think after several things that happened to me in, you know, in terms of my career um, choices after after university, I, at university, I did economics. But that's because I was so influenced by my economics teacher from Atlantic College, who was um, an exile from South Africa. He was uh, he was um, a colleague of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. He had to find an exile founded in the UK and he was teaching economics, happened to be in my school, influenced me so much. So I went to do economics. I struggled a bit with maths and everything, <laughs> but still I'm happy I did it. I did a short period of time in the corporate sector, thinking that was, you know, when, when I went to LSE in the middle of London, the city of London was very close. At that time I thought, mm, well, maybe I'll go into the, into that sector. I did. I left it very quickly and went into the NGO sector. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is, this is where it happened because I really realized that there's more, um, there's more to life than just making a lot of money. Um, there's really something about your professional um, journey, your ability to feel fulfilled as a person, but also being in a sector which at least in principle should care. Mm -hmm. And in te technical, it, and in reality, most of the time it cares. Although of course we we come across situations where this is not this 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 does this this is not always true, but this is mm -hmm. how this is how it happens. But I really then decided, you know, uh, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to be heading to. And I guess the the focus on on Europe and the 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 the, the engagement with with uh, associations, with organizations, stakeholders from. <laughs> Well, yeah. uh, but with people precisely because at the end of at the uh, sort of at the end of any organization at the end of any advocacy there is usually a person mm -hmm. or a living creature or you know <laughs> the, the environment animals yeah. but in many of the cases like this there there are people at the end of it you know i was i i was remembering something when i was listening to you first of all i don't know if you know but i used to live in poland okay uh, which is in the middle of nowhere. Fantastic, fantastic and Polish no, Maya. Yeah. <laughs> nobody knows where Bistrica uh -huh. is. But uh, and back then, so we were a team of so many people volunteering mm -hmm. that summer. It was an EVS program, maybe the older uh -huh. generation will remember what yes, EVS was. I still remember as well. So <laughs> it's happy. really bad yeah. to remember. <laughs> oh no, I'm joking. But we had what really uh, struck me to remember that we had an Italian mm -hmm. uh, volunteer there who she was uh, a daughter of a diplomat and she had to change more or less every two years where she lived. Right. And every time I spoke to her, I got more or less what you were trying to resume now in what it means to change so drastically mm -hmm. where you live at such a young age because it somehow changes the filter you see life through. Yeah. It just somehow makes you more understanding thinking about freedoms in a different way thinking mm -hmm. about identity in a different way and every time i spoke to her i was like oh my god the first time i was on a plane was when i was like 21 mm -hmm. i the first time i was abroad and that so many people laugh at that story but as a bulgarian the first time i was abroad was when i was eight and we went to wait for it macedonia okay yeah <laughs> so, which which is i mean the most Close to Bulgaria, mm. I mean, it's it's a similar language, similar alphabet. So yeah. It was not a good example for a cultural shock, but I was so shocked. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that if you somehow compare this experience to somebody who has lived in, I don't know, 10 countries by the age of yes. 20. I was looking at that Italian lady as a goddess. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, you've lived in 11 lives. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I completely relate to that as well. Be be before I went to uh, to the UK, to Atlantic College, I really never, we never really traveled anywhere abroad, you know? <laughs> and uh, again, precisely, I completely <laughs> can appreciate what you're saying. Yes. So seeing Wales and seeing different parts of the world at such a young age shaped your attitude to to people to work mm -hmm. your career what can you say maybe are the defining moments in your career which led to uh well so i didn't introduce you properly but i do that in the description you've been the president of the social platform yeah. also when it comes to volunteer mm -hmm. work one of the biggest networks uh in europe is mm -hmm. uh, something very close to your heart as well yeah. and we'll talk about it but what were the concrete steps which actually defined your career path to brussels sure so 
by network we were operating out of the out of the UK for 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 many years. Holland Europe is now 44 years old. Okay. It's a network that started off in the Netherlands, then the Secretariat moved uh, to the UK, and uh, the reason why it was in the UK is because the UK had a very um, I think it's it's voluntary sector mm-hmm. um, has been for many many years decades I would say without I'm not shaming other um, parts of Europe but it ha- has been extremely advanced mm-hmm. when it comes to volunteering volunteer management uh, standards in volunteering uh, protection of volunteers recognition th- recognition yeah. precisely safeguarding well-being uh, all of these Things have been thought of really, really many years before they started being thought of in in, in other countries. Mm-hmm. So I think that one of the defining moments was when uh, in 2011 uh, we had the European Year of Volunteering. But I was part of the together with uh, some other networks such as um, CEV, uh, European Youth Forum, the Scouts Movement. We all got together as those networks, mm-hmm. and we thought actually, you know, we're stronger together. We're stronger as a pack. And since around 2008, uh, 2009, we started a big lobbying campaign with uh, with with the institutions to have 2011 designated as the European mm-hmm. Year of Volunteering. And we had a lot of support from the UK government as well. And I remember probably the, the sort of the big moment that will stick in my head is I came to, uh, we had these m- meetings with the different perm reps as well. We were lobbying the the MEPs, writing them letters, calling them up and, and really, really pissing them off probably sometimes, you know, but we thought like, okay, and I was much younger back then as well. So I had <laughs> way more energy uh, to do these things. But I remember coming to the, um, coming to Brussels and going to the UK perm rep for another sort of progress meeting to see where we are because they were the uh, the UK was really really supportive of the whole thing and i remember arriving at the meeting and my contact there basically i went into into the room and she said actually we don't need to have this meeting you've got it okay and i thought wow <laughs> this is so incredible and then it That's all happened great. yes it really and then it really really it's happened it's rare but it's yeah. great yeah fabulous and I think this was the, the real defining moment because then having a whole year designated and recognized mm-hmm. at all levels, but also in all EU member states mm-hmm. uh, was was really amazing. Hungary was doing the presidency of the first six months. Poland was doing the second um, half of 2011. Back then, the two countries were in a completely different political place. Well, where Hungary is now, Poland is thankfully has returned to, yeah. to it after 15th of October um, of last year. But, you know, they were coming from, they were ex-communist countries as well, where volunteering was a dirty word for a long time. Mm-hmm. Same as I'm sure you you might remember from Bulgaria, you know, yeah. you volunteer by being forced to go on the 1st of May parade. Yeah. Um, you go and volunteer as a child because you're forced to go and pick up, you know, potatoes from fields and stuff like that, you know, yeah. and volunteering was really, really not there. So these were countries which, and the whole of the Central Eastern Europe had a really, really weak uh, volunteering it's infrastructure. A bad image. Exactly. It's a bad image. Exactly. Yeah. So our ambitions were to change this image, but also work on things like volunteering recognition, volunteering empowerment, volunteer management. So this, this working around this uh, goals um, together with, in the end, 60, 70 networks uh, mm. as an alliance for the year of volunteering were incredible. Well, that was absolutely fantastic. Nice. I don't remember exactly like the the reason why the volunteering part had such a bad image uh, yeah. after the changes in Bulgaria because mm-hmm. I I'm born 1985 five, so I really missed the whole volunteering last year volunteering in the communistic way yeah. but I've heard stories about it yeah and then I remember that when I was already in my like early 20s and we would speak about volunteering there was always this well, that's just unpaid work. Why would you do unpaid exactly, work? Exactly. It was not even like losing time, but it's just like you have to work. And then if you're not getting the money, that's just lost time yeah. for you. You must be, <laughs> basically the, the attitude that I, I sometimes have come across as well as, you know, you must be stupid to volunteer yes, here. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you could be making money in that time, you know, it, and it, this, I think the problem Maya is that when it's, um, but it's a, it's a, it's a bigger, it's a bigger issue, I think is. Uh, there's a danger if our societies become much, you know, the more individualistic they become, mm-hmm. the more, f- the less focus there is on the the community mm-hmm. utility of 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 being together as a group. 
basically. Yeah. Right. And maybe the, you know, what's most important then is your immediate nuclear family, if you have constructed mm. it around you, but then the community doesn't really, um, it's not that much of an importance. And I think that there's a huge danger for it. For mm. this reason, you know, despite, I would say, despite the fact that, you know, Europe has many issues. I'll talk, when I talk about Europe, I talk both about EU, but the Council of Europe, because I'm also in, engaged there as well. But, you know, I'm so happy to have been born in Europe. Yeah. And for example, not being born I don't know, in the US, for example, mm -hmm. because for me, that's sort of the, 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 the idea of just a, a very market based, um, society where really you have to fend for yourself mm -hmm. or you're gone. Yeah. It really just doesn't sit rightly with me. I think it's very difficult to mm. live like that. And I don't think that many people maybe can identify that exactly because I mean, mostly when you're in a such a dynamic situation you mm -hmm. don't have time to disengage reflect and see where's the problem so you just function yeah and i think it's very difficult to be that much driven by economic growth mm -hmm. and not recognizing it all the time or, or recognizing it all the time i don't know but i i want to go back a bit to to the volunteering part mm -hmm. i think that maybe uh it's good also for you to hear but i remember that year from the point of a volunteer and from the point of an organization working with okay. volunteers that was huge for us mm -hmm. because we had that and we could use that as a door opener to go uh, into precisely. the municipality and say look that's what europe is doing and we should be doing it as yes. well because we are part of europe yeah and it was so good and one uh i will shout out her her name is darina ivanova she's the person who more or less opened my eyes towards volunteering opportunities and all of that. And she was using your ear as, mm -hmm. as a good practice also to construct, and it's still functioning to this day, a municipality volunteer program where mm -hmm. the municipality of Varna used to collect needs of different, like the library and the different places where they needed vol volunteers, also NGOs. And then they would actually pay an insurance and like daily allowance to volunteers to do that. And that was like a best practice and I'm speaking about like 15 years ago, yeah. which was not so common to have that. Mm -hmm. But it's good for you to know that that really had yeah, an impact. No, it's, 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 uh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think also, you know, the introduction of laws on volunteering in Central Eastern yeah. European countries. Again, this this led to, to the fact that uh, the... I wouldn't say the pressure, the sort of the, the positive experiences coming from, from the top, from the EU level, but also from countries which had mm. legislations in place or had these sort of unwritten social contracts with the voluntary sector, like in the, like the UK has had, for example, and I'm still talking because I will want to mention Brexit at some point. You miss the UK. Yeah. <laughs> Within Europe. <laughs> Within Europe, exactly. No, uh, it's, okay. it, it's, it's led to the fact that, uh, volunteering became, um, uh, <clears throat> in a sense, protected volunteers became looked after. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, because there it was the it legislation was, a topic was a, precisely, yeah. and things have sprung up from from that time. I mean, if you look at the European Solidarity Corps now as well, yeah. it has its roots as well, very much in in how the recommendations coming out from the European Year of Volunteering, the policy recommendations that we created with civil society, with organisations from all over um, all over the member states but also with the private sector, which was really on yeah. board with us. You know, the whole idea of corp of employee volunteering, now employer-based volunteering as well, making sure that it's not sort of um, uh, volunteer washing. Yeah, uh, yeah. The whole thing changed completely. So, yeah, so the, this, this was a, a hugely defining moment for me and I guess made me believe that if you are really convinced of, of something and you get enough traction and backing, because you do need a lot of backing and sometimes you really have to fight things as a group rather than fighting things alone because you then end up like Don Quixote basically, you know, <laughs> against those Brussels windmills. Um, and the windmills win. Mostly, yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yes, Maya, these are the sort of, these were the roots which really shaped my thinking that actually this is in, in, in the setting of Europe, this is where mm -hmm. I, I thrive. Um, I find like, just as I was 16 going to Atlantic, college and finding so many diverse people. This is exactly the sort of environment where I'm finding diverse, inspiring people that I'm surrounding myself with from whom I can learn. Hopefully maybe they can learn something from me as well, but it's not only about the, the sort of the professionalism as well. It's about the personal connections that you create with people as well. 
Yeah, I think that's that's the be- the best and the biggest resource that the Brussels windmill is actually offer because there's such a diversity of people mm-hmm. and of like human capital, but in the in the good way of saying it because I don't like human capital. It sounds very capitalistic yes. sometimes. Yeah. But if you see people just as a system of resources yeah. of learning opportunity, Brussels is the place. So you've been involved for a while in the Brussels dynamics in the in the EU bubble. It must be very rewarding to be to see how generations mm-hmm. of politicians change, leadership changes. Mm-hmm. Some countries go back to the bright side as Poland. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but it also must be quite annoying if you're really struggling for changes in certain areas and they don't arrive. So mm-hmm. can you try maybe to brief me about the rewarding part of mm-hmm. being in the EU bubble and the annoying part of being in the yeah. EU bubble? Yeah, so I think, uh, so let's look at the, the rewarding because it's more fun. Um, I, as you mentioned, Maya, before, I was I had the honor to be the president of Social Platform for um, for two mandates, so for four years, between, um, in the, I think, April, May 2019, up until um, June last year, June 23. And uh, being elected to that position really... Um, enabled me, you know, first of all, the, the, mo- the rewarding thing happened on a very sort of personal, professional level f- for me, because I felt like I'm going back to school, but in a, a, a great school again, because really this, I, it made me believe, yes, there is an element of lifelong learning in all of us. And the, and the spark that is basically reignited about wanting to learn, wanting to find out more about the the incredible members membership of of social platform but also social platform itself being just such a uh incredibly important um civil society but also i would say political animal in mm. in, in in that um eu sphere um the influence that it can um wield uh the way it can bring the voices of of enhance the voices of its members which already in themselves are absolute experts each and each one on their own you know they they specialize so much whether it would be mm-hmm. in um disabled people's rights rights of migrant people um lgbtqi uh, rights volunteering like my network or active citizenships but we all are there together because we want to achieve more social justice mm-hmm. so the social platform being the amplifier of these of these voices mm-hmm. um and acting there as the as the sort of the the magnet to bring them together and 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 multiply their voices and make them you know make them sound, sound louder, and being put in a position of trust as as a as a president of this net of of this amazing network that was that was a hugely rewarding uh, thing for me uh, personally professionally as well and then really getting to understand much better how the how the whole sector works that was a big learning curve for me. So this will this will be probably an example of the rewarding side. Um, another super important highlight for me was well, I mean my 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 first mandate actually coincided with COVID, right? So great timing. <laughs> so that's maybe let's say okay, that was a uh, but this give affected, me a yeah. rewarding conclusion. I, there is a rewarding conclusion. Conclusion <laughs> is when the Portugal held organized the social summit in in um i think it was may 2021 so we were just coming out we were still in the pandemic but it was mm-hmm. things were reopening and portugal back then the portuguese government was really really open minded towards civil society and working with us to already ahead of their presidency to engage mm-hmm. social platform as the voice of civil society and i had a i had a speaking role at the summit um with the other sec gens or presidents sorry the other presidents of of uh the other stakeholder groups social partners trade unions business groups but you know speaking being able to voice the concerns and the needs and the demands and actually what really really bugs us and bothers us as organized civil society in front of all the heads of state as well mm-hmm. that was a rewarding and to a very difficult period of the pandemic and mm-hmm. you know working in a network which it in itself had some issues with with the with capacity um yeah. that was a that was a very re- rewarding moment no i can see that there were so many moments during the pandemic where there was no space for civil society on mm. anything mm-hmm. so yeah I, I understand why why you feel that it's a bit ironic though to mention portugal today you know, i know because of the elections exactly yeah yeah, yeah. we're yeah. recording that one day one after, day after the, the elections very right wing yeah. uh 
yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Portugal. Look, Poland came back. Yes, so exactly. You never know. Exactly, mm. exactly. Okay, and then well, the, I understand where you're starting from the good parts, mm-hmm. and I think that generally it's good to underline these good parts. Because especially in the frame of Europe going a bit right wing, not only yeah. Portugal, it's good to really remind people why Europe as a platform works and the EU yeah. actually is a good tool. Yeah. Of course, many things to fix. Yeah. But as a general thing, it's a good thing to mm-hmm. to have a European platform to work on. What are the annoying things that you want to see less in the EU bubble? Yeah, um, I think there should be much more work done on tackling misinformation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how how uh, misinformation how information can easily be manipulated mm-hmm. and basically sold to people how it how, how very easily accessible it can be yeah. made and how there is for me there's a lack of um much bigger focus on social media literacy and i'm not mm-hmm. talking just social media literacy for example just for young people because because it's not just young people who are affected by um by by fake news by disinformation it's all age groups that can be mm-hmm. affected by it yeah but it's becoming more and more difficult you know i recently saw something which was a deep fake of a speech mm-hmm. and it took me a while to, that i i watched the speech and i was like that must be fake but at, i actually yeah. watched it and later on because generally when i see yeah. you know this fake news mm-hmm. when they're a newspaper article or a blog article you can always tell because mm-hmm. it's very clickbaity feeling yeah. about it but the deep fake when it comes to video it's becoming too convincing yeah. and i'm not sure i would say maybe we need not only a media training or social media training mm-hmm. which is more accessible and maybe part of high school curriculum or something like that but we actually need technical labeling of things like that because they're very misleading yes exactly very misleading I, totally and i think you know i i said i will mention it now it's what happened with brexit you know i and this is very personal. I came to the UK when I was 16. I was living there for, for, for many, many years. I became a British citizen. And, and you know, I, there was so, so much good when it comes back to things such as the, uh, the, the civil society sector, voluntary mm-hmm. sector, in terms of the, um, the learning and the exchanges that the UK and other member mm-hmm. states were, were able to take out of being in the sort of club, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and look, and the decision that split the country so much, so much based on um, basically crap information and lies being fed mm. to people, it made me feel really first-handed that, you know, it felt like a, like a spit in my face, basically, when, when the referendum to, to, um, took place. Uh, because I really felt that, you know, this, okay, well, there was a referendum, but really it was based on the fact that there it was, was just, yeah, manipulated. And equally, the side that, that was... F- 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 trying to fight for the remain vote was not working harder than enough. And I feel that this is repeating sometimes in the current times as well in Europe is that the, the extreme right is absolutely fully in the grips of knowing how to use mm. media, how to basically find an object of, I don't know, of a scapegoat and produce that scapegoat so it's thrown into the you know into the into the circles will then basically eat it up and think yeah "Yeah, this is exactly you know why we have to do something radical about it and then mix with that um horrible use of language which is another thing that bothers me a lot is that i think over the years and i've been doing the european bubble for now well over well probably around 15 years as well if I think back, I think some of the the ways that um, I think politicians just are very gentle. This is a huge standard, you know, generalization, but the language which is employed mm-hmm. very often these days in the run up to elections. If I think ten years ago, it would have not been thought possible yeah, to no. be used like this. Right. The more nasty, offensive, humiliating, degrading. Uh, you can be in the way you use language, the better it sells because mm. it's much better for, for social attention. media. Maybe yeah. People will pay attention. So yeah, the more of a boor you are, you wear almost like a badge. Yeah. You know, I'm a boor. I'm, um, I'm a, I use I language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That sort of political bullying in the language that that's something that really, really bothers me a lot. I, 
pay close attention to what's happening in Bulgaria, even mm-hmm. though it's been nearly three years, so I don't live there anymore. Yeah. And But I don't think it's maybe the same with you in Poland. It's not possible to not pay attention to the point of where it becomes unhealthy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, so last week, and I do a bit of a social commentary only in Bulgaria and in, in social media when it comes to mm-hmm. local political processes. And I was, one of the things that really struck me last week, so there was the start of the Bulgarian bachelor. Mm-hmm. And in the same time, there is negotiation for the government. Okay. Half of the population is following how, you, you know, I mean, not yeah. everybody follows parliament, not everybody follows the bachelorette. I happen to follow both. And I was wondering that it's so weird that we have so many uh, requirements towards the women who are in the bachelor. Are they pretty? Are they smart? How do they speak? What do they wear? But then when it comes to politicians, we don't ask them any of those. Mm -hmm. How do they speak? They speak horribly. Mm -hmm. Do they show respect? No, they don't. Do they look good? Most of them, no. I'm not sure how that's relevant, but they don't really. Yeah. Do like, would we want our son or daughter to marry any of them? No, no. So I think that we've somehow made it okay for politicians to be like that, to be rude Mm -hmm. and to act horribly in the public eye uh-huh. and then we're just yeah but it's just politics they it's a dirty thing that that's how yeah. it is and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be at all i mean i'm not of course it's a simple thing to uh, compare the bachelor and, and national government elections and things like that but it's different categories of life yeah they, ex- they coexist in the same time in the same territory so why not compare mm. And I think that it's also the way that, for example, in Europe, we speak about Merkel, let's say, or we, we speak about uh, Orban as well. We we qualify people in certain way that sometimes we cannot go back from it. Mm-hmm. The way we put labels, yes. it's not fine. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, and and I wouldn't say, and I think the, the, the way language is used is actually done by, has been abused by all political colors. Yeah. It's yeah. not just that it's white. One one side uh, sort of excels better. It's, no innocence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I I want to go back m- more to you and your political and professional choices. It's been interesting to explore your identity because you have many hats. Mm-hmm. So you're you're a Polish man, but you're you're grieving for the UK now with Brexit. I can see. I mean, so. sort of. It sort of you know it comes <laughs> back to me from time to time, and the reason being that, for example, I just left my. Um, Right now we are working, we are partners in this really incredible horizon project uh, that looks at the future of uh, lives with oceans and with water, Mm -hmm. but about how young people will be the stewards of water Mm -hmm. and how water really, we have to approach water and especially fresh water as a, as from the human rights um, Mm -hmm. uh, approach. So we right now have a, a, a big sort of group of young people working together. They, they represent the North, North Sea region and yeah, I'm missing young um, participants from the UK uh, in this because you know they're not UK is not part of Horizon program or yeah. from or the other um, opportunities that existed there yeah. before. And why I'm grieving is because in my network we lost so many UK members as well. That yeah. you know had were sort of who unable. lost so many yeah. opportunities. Exactly, exactly. So that's so a... that's my grief. Yes. No, I I understand it fully. I I understand that that's something that you feel dear because also your I mean these forming years of your life mm-hmm. you relate with the UK. So if we have to combine how a Polish man who went to the UK confident enough to come out started mm-hmm. into politics, like what's do you think your identity shapes your political choices and career choices or how does your identity relate with your work mm. as as a whole, as a Piotr? Yeah, you're right, Maya. I mean, the thing is, I yeah, I think it's been a it's been a huge um, gift given to me by the opportunities, you know, or by wh- whichever way the sort of there might be some constellations of the planets and the things were thrown at me, you know, and I maybe just grasped them or I maybe stepped at them at the right um, stepped up to them at the right time. Um, but they didn't come with a you know price free basically you know I paid mm-hmm. prices for it as okay. as well um, personally or um, in terms of my well being, um, but I guess the 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 way that my identity has been sh- identity has been shaped by exposure to different to different cultures exposure to um, different minds opinions. 
trying to find consensus around um, maybe pr problems and how you approach solving a problem. And also understanding that maybe you'll never arrive at, you know, at a, at a hundred percent, everybody agreeing with you, because actually that would be also slightly boring, you know, if, if that were never to happen. Never happened to me. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I think it definitely has affected the way I, um, I, I, I lead mm -hmm. in terms of being, I think very embracing as a, as a, as a leader, as an employer, but also I think when I was, for example, when I was president of social platform as well, really wanting to, to learn, to listen, to engage with, with the members, but also engage with my colleagues who were with me on the management committee mm -hmm. as well, who were incredible people. And I know you interviewed, um, at least one of them as well, Catherine, yeah. uh, from, from EDF as well, who was the vice president. Uh, she was my me. first guest. There, yeah. that, that's right. That's right. So, you know, and there, there, there have been other people like, uh, Michelle Lavoy as well from, from Beacom, um, Heather Roy from Eurodiaconia. Now, Mikael, who is still on, Mikael Ley from Solidar, who is, um, still on the board of, uh, so, uh, of social platform, but, you know, everybody who I have come across and work with as well, it was, it, I think through my open mindedness, I hope they were able to see that I'm really also keen to, to learn from them, but also support them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, yeah, I think my, um, what really sort of has stayed with me is the open mindedness. Mm -hmm. Um, tolerance is sometimes a word which is overused or a very cliche. Um, but yes, I would still say, you know, tolerance mm -hmm. and, um, because sometimes if you get even irritated about things, you still need to be tolerant, yeah. right. And to not let your emotions choose, sort of overspill yeah. and, and, uh, and stuff like that. Okay. You might want to go to a room afterwards and sort of <laughs> scream your guts, guts out. <laughs> it's um, your yeah, time. <laughs> but it's my time to do it, you know? Uh, but yeah, the, these, that's what, how I think of it. But I think that that's very nice way of approaching leadership it's a very kind way of approaching leadership mm -hmm. where you keep in mind that the rest of the people have to give as much as you have to give yeah. and that it takes uh sort of adjusting the dynamics so everybody can have their their space we we talk with alva about that as well mm -hmm. she was here uh three episodes ago okay. so and it, we also discussed with her the importance of well-being but i must say that when you i mean you she as a secretary, Jen, and you as a president started to work more on well-being within mm. the social platform. Yeah. For me, it was a really inspiring moment to see that well-being actually has a place when it comes Absolutely. to uh, a, just a conversation that you uh, somehow relate to the workplace. Because yeah. I think that for many of us, well-being is an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not It's not the solution, it's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's go a bit there. I, you've shared that uh, well-being for you is a central point mm -hmm. when it comes to your work. Are there any well-being uh, challenges you want to talk about that you've overcome so far? And why do you think well-being is important? Yeah, I mean, one thing exactly what happened is with my, um, when Alva was the Secretary General of Social Platform, that's absolutely true. We worked together and had the sort of the support of the secretariat as well. And this is something which is now being continued very much so by, uh, by Laura de Bonfils, the current sec gen, um, but this focus on well-being and there being an actual written well-being strategy plan mm -hmm. for the organization. And I must say it was really, I found it really coming from, you know, I mentioned earlier the UK, how advanced safeguarding well-being yeah. was uh, the, the sort of policies. They didn't exist there just for the sake of existing. They were living policies. Yeah. And it, there's a reason why they were living policies that, you know, rather than just being a document, which you tick a box, basically when you're applying mm -hmm. for funding saying, here we go, we have it, We've, we have <laughs> it, you know, no, you have to live it. You have to work with it. So this is where something, you know, I found that, wow, that in Brussels, many organizations still didn't have, you know, yeah. uh, things such as safeguarding, um, well-being approaches, especially working maybe with, with beneficiaries, which who might be, uh, falling into the vulnerable, um, mm. adult groups as well. And not having a safeguarding policy. I found that a bit shocking. So there was yeah. a lot of catching up. So I think it was really, it was a great piece of work that Alva was doing. And I was really supporting her as well around the issue of well-being, um, being put in place the monitoring of how it, how it, how it evolves. And yes. And then the, the thing about whether, um, 
why do you support? Why do I support it? Yes, because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have struggled myself at times. Sometimes, you know, I'm in the, I've always been a very sort of eager person. I think maybe it does come, come across, but to be engaged, to be, to, to have my sort of input into my, where, if my input is needed, I'm very happy to sort of vol jump up and volunteer. Volunteering is, you know, something really close to me as well, but I have been finding myself sometimes, um, split in so many different directions and pulled in so many different directions that it then starts to drain you. Exactly. It starts to overwhelm you as well. Mm -hmm. Bring into that, uh, then what I would probably say in me is, um, an addictive personality, uh, and you can arrive at a place which is, uh, which is dangerous mm -hmm. for, uh, for you as a, as an individual. And it definitely happened with me as well. Um, so my, I've been struggling with, with, with alcohol for, uh, for uh, probably for, for quite a few years as well, you know, and I will never blame it on the fact that I come from Poland. You know, I find it's that that's, that's, that's rubbish <laughs> completely, <laughs> just basically, we, you know, or that I lived in the UK or something like this. That's, no, mm -hmm. that's nonsense. What I do think is, is the fact that I, yeah, I am a person who, you know, if I really go with something, I want to give hundred mm -hmm. percent, you know, it's the same time when I was going to the gym, you know, it was like a religion to me. I was one of those sad people who were there at six o'clock in the morning when the gym opens up, you know, darkness around and everything. I would be mm -hmm. there basically every single day. Unfortunately for me, it happened as well with, um, with alcohol. Mm -hmm. So those moments of being drained or being stressed, or, you know, I found, oh, it's actually a really easy way to reward myself. And, uh, it's a, for me, it, I, I didn't notice that it was a, a, a sort of a very slippery path that, mm -hmm. that, that can take you along with it. Basically, if you don't notice the signs too um, early enough as well. Um, and the fact that actually it's, it's, a what I now understand and realize much more is that it's, it's everywhere around us, mm -hmm. right? If you go to any or pr pretty much any reception, any function in the, in the institutions, and it's, it's always there. I mean, it starts at lunchtime really pretty much, yeah. you know, um, civil society week last week when I was engaged, absolutely. You can, you know, you can have your wine with your lunch and nobody's forcing you to have it, but it is so, uh, easily available yeah. and easily and readily available as well. And then unfortunately, if you sort of come across and if you're struggling and if you're not sharing with it, um, that, you know, you have a, you, that there is a problem that you're encountering, you, at least in my case, it happened that, you know, I would just play along with it as, as well. And yeah, then it started affecting me, my, my, my mental health as well. And it, it was a, it was a, it was a long journey until I got to the point where I thought, actually, now I need to seek help. And I mm -hmm. think this seeking of help, um, has been absolutely crucial to, 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 to break, break, um, I guess, yeah, just, just, just really, really going downhill. Mm -hmm. And I would say everybody has their sort of rock bottom that they can, you know, hit. It can be completely different for, for, um, every different person. Yeah. I felt at some point in around May 22, I reached that point. I sort of shot myself away. Um, to, I went to, to Poland, went to a, a recovery rehab center, a place, a clinic for a whole month. That was during my, again, and, but this was during the time that I was still president of Social Platform. And this is incredible, the, the support that I found from within my colleagues in the board, but also in the secretariat as well. You know, I was given full understanding as well, which is sometimes, mm -hmm. which I think I was a very lucky person to be in as well, because unfortunately I still believe there's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. that abounds around, um, mental health, but also addictions, mm -hmm. especially in, in, um, in, I think in our sector as well, uh, that, you know, it's like you should be yeah, immune to that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly enough. And precisely Maya, that we should be immune to it. And we're not, we're just, we're just human mm. beings. We're constructed of physical health and we're constructed of mental health. And, um, and for some people, it's perfectly fine for people like me who have, um, an issue with alcohol. That is something that I just need to have out of my life completely, mm -hmm. you know? So I've been working, yeah. So I've been working with it, with the support of therapy, 
um, with the support of uh, of groups, um, meeting with other people as well. So I've been doing a lot of work on smart recovery, um, which has a much more sort of psychological but peer approach to uh, talking about the issue of addiction. Um, it's less focused on the fact that there's a higher, you know, higher power that can guide you. I'm not a religious uh, person myself, mm -hmm. so that really didn't work with me. But the more sort of science-based, but also sharing-based uh, mm -hmm. approach with 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 being with other people who have been going through similar problems has been really helpful. And I think the most important thing as well, uh, Maya, is the fact that I'm so open to talk about it mm -hmm. now i really feel zero shame and i don't think we should feel shame you shouldn't feel you know? shame at all and i think that mm -hmm. the more people hear other people mm -hmm. talking about it they normalize actually seeking help yeah because the more shame there is in such a, a matter people are just hiding it and it doesn't lead anywhere yeah. if you're hiding it you know in one of the first episodes uh maybe if if you're digging deep enough, you've already reached Gabor Mate, the, the Hungarian-born Canadian later on in life psychologist who okay. studies the link between trauma and addiction. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with this guy. Okay. I've eaten yeah. all of his books. And I started to be interested in addiction because I used to work in back at home. I was supporting youngsters who were raised in orphanages. Mm -hmm. Most of them had any type of problem with addiction, either alcohol or, or drugs. Yeah. Uh, cause they, honestly, it would never be gambling cause they didn't have money. So mm -hmm. it was always something which is accessible and, and cheap. And unfortunately you can get alcohol, as you said, it's yeah. everywhere. And I realized the more I read about addiction and how to approach, cause the, the worst thing is to hide it. Then the second worst thing is to judge. Wow. Well, well, that's just an addict or oh, mm -hmm. how shameful, how horrible it doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't yeah. help anyone. And it doesn't help you stop it. And I realized the more I was reading about it, that first of all, I also have addictive personality. Mm -hmm. And it took me, I was a heavy smoker, like really heavy, heavy smoker. I would go two packs per day. Yeah. If I was awake, I would smoke. Mm -hmm. And I always had something in the back of my mind, which would tell me that I shouldn't try drugs. Because mm -hmm. I know that if I try and I'm, I'm curious, I still play with the idea of doing uh, ayahuasca and things like that. And I, I know that yeah. I most likely shouldn't because I would not be that person who does it once. I don't think I'm, I'm able to do it once. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why this is never publicly discussed as mm -hmm. a topic that you should reflect on how you see the world, how you see substances, what do you have a healthy relationship with alcohol, with food, with ayahuasca or with whatever, and yeah. there is nothing shameful about it. Yes, no, we should be definitely these questions. This should, it should be much more in the open as well and the connection as well with with your um you know with with mental health as well and um why there cannot be there must be much i mean there must be no stigma attached to it mm -hmm. as well i remember i went through um, i think personally as well you know it'll come up very we're what 12 of march now 16th of march st patrick's day it'll be 12 years exactly that my mom died um uh of of, of ovarian cancer and I remember that basically I knew this was going to happen, but, and actually it was, um, first and foremost, it was a relief for her to, you know, to not be in, in pain anymore, I think. And, but I remember that, you know, it took me years to even cry because I just wasn't dealing with it at all. Um, and addressing the grief. Mm -hmm. But yes, my, there were other ways that I was addressing it, you know, helping myself yeah. get through it, basically, which were driven by the fact that I had, I was uh, living with an, a, you know, addictive personality as well. But the connection between what you said, the connection between trauma and addiction is a very strong one, because I thought, I think, and having done enough therapy as well now as well, I know that my mom's uh, death and me not um, addressing it properly and soon enough is also also created mm -hmm. a trauma in 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 inside me that that reinforced my problems very much so and you needed yeah. to feed it with exactly with the drinking yeah. yeah yeah i'm so happy that you are on the path of recovery and i'm so mm -hmm. happy for you that you were strong enough and your support system was strong enough to push you in the direction of recovery mm -hmm. Thank and, you. and thank you yeah. for sharing that as well. There is such a huge stigma about men talking 
generally about mental health, yeah. which is so wrong and yeah. so so unnecessary. Mm-hmm. So thank you for, for no, addressing that. I'm very, you know, now, as I say, now I'm very, very happy to talk about it as well. I do remember... Um, if I compare where I am now and being able to also say to somebody that the reason why I'm not drinking is because I have a problem with, 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 with alcohol. I'm much, I'm, I have no issue now saying this, but I remember being at the informal EBSCO, um, on behalf of a social platform in, in, in France, in Bordeaux, uh, when France was, uh, holding the presidency and of all places, we were in the wine, the, the museum of wine in Bordeaux, where the official dinner was being organized. And I remember sitting at a table with other, uh, representatives from, from the member states, from, from, from other institutions. And, you know, it was wonderful wine around me, but I wasn't feeling, you know, I didn't feel like, okay, I have to partake in it, but I was finding it very uncomfortable. I was really, really like so stressed going there thinking about, okay, wine is going to be served and I will say I'm not drinking. And I was so terrified of somebody asking me the question, why aren't you drinking? Yeah. And of course that question was asked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that moment I had this sort of like moment of almost like a panic, basically, do I say why for real or do I make up a story? And back then I wasn't ready to talk about Mm -hmm. it that much. So I made up a story, you Mm -hmm. know, that was crap basically, (laughs) you know, but I know that at that point in time, I just wasn't, I, I just wasn't ready, but I also didn't talk enough with, with people who are supporting with, with a therapist about how you basically can approach it. In the end of the day, it's nobody's business. I don't have to yeah. tell them, you know, yeah. but if I, I got to a place where I'm perfectly comfortable with, with saying, with, with saying so that, you know, you. yeah, it's, and it's almost like you, you drop shackles from you, you know, um, when, when you're, when you're able to do it. And it, but it's, it's not an easy journey, you know, for me, it's like, I always think about this, like you try to say, okay, I'm going to be a superhuman now, you know, it's your, st- if you have a, that sort of approach when you're dealing with, with addictions, I think, um, and if you know, you have a, have, have a, have an issue, have a problem. If you have that sort of approach, it's almost like stepping into a ring with Mike Tyson, mm-hmm. you know, or whoever is boxing these days, Anthony Joshua or somebody, you know, <laughs> you will lose. You can try. You but... can try, but you will <laughs> lose basically. No. So yeah. I think having a bill, being a bit more humble as well about the fact that, you know, this is actually a very, this is a very human problem as well. And it affects so many people yeah. all over the world. Uh, whether, no matter which, like, what path of life you're coming from, you know. Mm. I, I'm interested now to try to draw a parallel from what you shared and that very personal story to how, do you think that maybe in 10 or 20 years, policies would have advanced so much Mm -hmm. that it would not be stigmatized to talk about it and that there actually will be properly publicly accessible tools for that because i also i have friends who struggled with addiction and even if you are strong enough to understand yourself and where you're at it's Mm -hmm. actually very expensive to address it and if you're not in a place in life where you can afford that yeah you have to deal with it alone because there are no public tools in most countries i'm not sure maybe okay luxembourg and belgium have that but like in majority of where we are in as a civilization there is not public tools which are high quality and result oriented yeah. when they address uh, addiction. So, what do you think needs to be done in health policies or yeah. in social policies to address that? No, um, absolutely. I mean, I, I still spend um, a bit of time in the UK. My husband is is British, works uh, sort of on a, a no, let's say part time in, in the UK. I also live in Spain. Um, I'm a bit As of a many Brits. nomadic, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But also because of I've been living there for quite a few years now. Also, I'm, I'm engaged more politically with 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 uh, in Spain. Um, but I found that, for example, by investing in public um, public social health policies and the provision of support services around, for example, addiction is absolutely the most, the cleverest, one of the cleverest sort of things that, uh, policymakers and those who basically think about the budgets and where budgets should go mm-hmm. really, really can make, uh, make those decisions. Um, I have experienced it myself as well. Going, like you said, you know, 
the if you want to seek help very often it's very expensive because you okay you will get an, an incredible service like when i went away for a month but i paid for it myself and it wasn't cheap to be able to you know but it was money well spent for sure <laughs> um but i know for example from my own experience in uh, experiences in the in the uk the there is so much more now available Mm-hmm. beyond the uh, for example the aa movement mm-hmm. which is you know i will not say a bad word at all about it you know it's 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 been there for years that there's a reason why it works just sometimes it doesn't maybe the the format doesn't appeal to some people yeah. like it hasn't appealed to me that much but it's it's an incredible support system uh community support sort of mm-hmm. community-based support system but in the i've seen in you know the availability especially around i guess um around big cities like metropolises like London, yes, pretty much anywhere where you find yourself in your borough uh, or the part of the city where you live, you will find access to these services. People will contact you, you will be able to meet groups, you will be able to get a counsellor, somebody who will be checking in with you, you know, like weekly uh, therapy sessions, exactly the care that happens because actually investing investing, um, funds into provision of services like this Again, let's make a look at it from the very utilitarian approach. It does pay off. Yeah. You create healthier, happier mm-hmm. people who then may be able to, you know, who might, for example, be struggling with work. They'll go back to work and they'll okay, pay taxes. Yeah, they'll pay taxes. Yeah. Exactly. They they'll spend less time on on maybe having to draw mm-hmm. draw down benefits as well. There is a complete, there is, there's so many connections yeah. as well, um, around that. That's why I think what needs to be happening. I mean, this is what's, what's now happening in Belgium under the Belgian presidency, as well as the fact that I think for the first time, pretty much ever, if I'm not mistaken, is this com this jumbo combo, um, ECOFIN and, uh, EBSCO council councils yeah. meeting together and actually talking to one another because mm-hmm. you cannot isolate financial, you know, the finance finance ministers from the, um, uh, health and social care services mm-hmm. and have not have them in the same room talking about these super important interconnected, uh, decisions, which ultimately have a person, have a human being at, 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 at their end. So, yes. Yeah, so I think it would be fantastic if that sort of model is, um, repeated perpetuated developed looked as a good practice that really we need to we need to strive towards to as well and the more countries in across mm-hmm. the member states that it spreads to as well that basically yes let's really break down the silos mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in between those decisions those financial decisions investments in health and social care and talking to and then actually this, and, and it's important to say the talking to the to the people who really know how the situation looks yeah. on the ground so bringing bringing in civil society the social care um providers uh people who work with minority groups with people who are left behind it is let's call it collectively the civil society which has that knowledge and that ability and put them as equal sort of talking partners to that I think that with all the criticism I have towards nowadays society and politicians, there is a clear progress made in that direction Mm -hmm. in the past years. It's not fast enough, but the direction is kind of good. Yeah. And part of that progress is also destigmatizing the topic of mental health and Mm -hmm. speaking about mental health as part of health because Mm -hmm. I always said, you know, in, in Bulgarian, it actually, it feels even weirder to talk about mental health because it's like a, a separate thing from health and it's yeah, not it's not yeah it's not yeah. actually you know last year with all that that happened to me i realized that based on stress i have so many new partially autoimmune diseases and i started to read about how mm-hmm. stress and autoimmune diseases uh con- correct uh, connect and how how they relate and i realized that it's i mean mental health it's very comfortable to be outside of health because I think that yeah. once we put it in health, it will become very expensive yeah. for the health system. So mm-hmm. now it's still, for example, if you want to go to a psychologist, even now more healthcare insurance will say that that's on you. Mm-hmm. Therapy is on you. It's not covered. But then how do we... That, that's wrong. That's what I mean. I'm trying to to make a very big point in not a very long sentence. But my question to you now is regarding mental health. Mm-hmm. 
uh, we started to be less ashamed to talk yeah. about mental health as mm -hmm. people. And I think that that also shows in policy making. Are there any concrete steps that you think can be made in the direction of mental health being the center of policy making mm -hmm. when it comes to health? Yeah, um, I think it will come to a few things that sort of immediately strike me, you know, come to my mind is uh, on the one hand is, is more leadership. Mm -hmm. So almost having role models, uh, within, within the, within our, mm, let's say political leaders, uh, happening at all levels. Mm -hmm. I think the more, if the, you know, having the understanding that actually my political career should not, will not be affected by the fact that I come out and speak openly about, um, about my mental health issues mm -hmm. or me who has some political aspirations as well, um, linked to maybe the, the upcoming European parliament elections, I shouldn't be approaching, um, them thinking, and I'm not thinking like that because I wouldn't be telling you about my issues and about my, 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 something that, you know, ha has been a problem for me. I should be free to be able to talk about my experiences and what has been detrimental to my physical and mental, um, well-being and be open about it. And I should feel we should be in a position where this will not impact your job, um, the ability of securing jobs that you actually are qualified for, mm -hmm. but also, um, let's say occupying political posts that you are qualified for as well, uh, because you can bring in that experience to that and as that well, resilience, right? And resilience, precisely. Something. So this is what I mean. People need to feel, um, safe to be able, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about leaders, basically, they need to feel safe that they can speak about their experiences because actually they can wield so much positive influence as well. If they just mm -hmm. open up about their own individual experiences, if they occupy positions of power or positions of decision-making. So yes, I think we need mm -hmm. that leadership, of, but, for, but we need to enable, empower those leaders to be, you know, to, to be, fr to, to, mm -hmm. to be free to do that and not be scared that their political careers might become ruined yeah you know maybe i'm living in a sort of maybe it's a it's an idealistic world but this is where i would really like for this to be to be to be happening i don't think it's idealistic i think it's just that we we have this very old-fashioned way of seeing leaders where yeah. they have to be serious and strict and like close and, yeah, right? yeah yeah but yeah. nobody's mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. So I think that it's more of having authenticity when we, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of the people in power struggle with addiction Yeah. because addiction and stress are yeah. very much linked. Yeah. So I, the, the <laughs> fact that they don't speak about it doesn't mean that mm -hmm. they don't struggle about it. They have just chosen not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Well, trying to have a bit of a swift between mental health and well-being. I want to go back to, to well-being now. Um, isn't it too comfortable to link work and well-being that much because i i always philosophically like to argue that well-being first of all is your own responsibility as a person i mm -hmm. mean work can mm -hmm. stress the hell out of you but you need to have your boundaries and i think that also comes with um life experiences like yeah. you have to mess it up a couple of times then to be okay this is my boundary i will not affect work be that much into my well-being yeah. But then the other argument that I'm also making is that if you're in the human rights field, in the policy making field, you identify with your job and that's mm -hmm. horrible, but you are, yeah. you are your job in a way. Yeah. So how do you make that work in your very dynamic life? How do you keep your well-being for yourself? But then where is the boundary between your work, mm -hmm. Piotr, and, and your life, yeah. Piotr? Yeah, no, I... I, I... Yes, exactly. And that's funny. You said that, you know, my, my, my work becomes my life. It's true. It's, I felt it so many times. I've also been told that, um, so many times as well by, um, you know, by my husband as well, you know, who, who is there, who I've been, we've been together for many, many years and, you know, he's been able to observe me as well, but I believe that, you know, he is also, he works in a completely different field in medicine as well super, super sort of expert in his medical field as well. So his work is also partly his life and actually, and pretty much work shapes anybody's life. Yeah. And especially if it's a work, which is, um, meaningful and rewarding, not just financially, but in terms of the sort of the, the dopamine, dopamine levels that you get from, 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 from it, it it's, it's something so such an crucial element of your life. So it's natural that, you know, work sometimes becomes your life, but yes, in our, 
and maybe in our sector as well, mm-hmm. it, it does true that it's sort of you go into it almost like, you know, 24 seven. Actually, yeah. there were sometimes, you know, more than 24 more hours than in a, <laughs> the, that sort of space of 24 hours. You wish you'd had them as well. Um, I think, you know, simple things that I have started do, trying to to achieve as well is. Um, yeah, uh, and I'm not there yet, but really thinking that okay that when the weekend comes you know try to do things which are <laughs> not related to your work because I actually, like how you said try to try to because <laughs> I'm still not it still hasn't happened and of course yeah. you know it'll never happen exactly I think this thinking that um actually I'm not um and I like this saying this is what uh my friend but also president of uh volunteer Europe, Una um, Aitken has said to me so many times like you're not in an ambulance service <laughs> <laughs> nobody will die because of the fact that I don't get something done over, let's say, Saturdays and Sunday. Okay, yes, you've got a funding deadline or something that's different. But generally speaking, mm. yes, I'm not a paramedic uh, driving an ambulance and I need to get to a, uh, to a yeah. person who's basically um, would drop dead unless I make it to that person, right? So, yeah, I do not run an ambulance service. Uh, maybe, and that is sometimes a very sort of like, say that to yourself when you're starting thinking and yeah. saying to yourself i need to do this now you know um forget about my my weekend right now or whatever say to yourself that you are not um running a service like that and maybe that sort of reminder you, yeah it gives you um a, a little bit of a a little bit of a, a distance reality yeah check. a reality check as well oh you know i'm um I was speaking last week uh, in Sofia on an event, and this week I'm also going back to Sofia for another event, and they're both related to gender, work, and leadership position for women. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I got during the panel was regarding the importance of a job for, for, and the importance of women being in a certain job. And I started to go into my head a bit. Um, I mean, it's, we discussed it, but I, I lost a job uh, quite uh, not that long time ago, but I lost a job because I decided to stand my right on something. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was a good decision, mm-hmm. I think, at the end. But you know, I was replaced four minutes after I was fired. Mm-hmm. Four minutes after mm-hmm. I was fired, somebody already was doing my job, mm-hmm. and that it took me quite some time to reflect on it and understand that you're not only replaceable Mm. you're so easily replaceable every one of us and that's so just so painful by the way Mm. (laughs) because you i mean all of us we're trying to do our job in the best way we can yeah and of course that requires dedication that we take away from the other areas of our life from Mm -hmm. from your husband from my husband from my kids from our friends and then that's like to have that that exactly four minutes later, somebody yeah. else will do your job. It's not a nice thing to have, but it's a good reality check as yes. well. Yes, yes, precisely. Precisely. I, I, I completely... Um, and where you're yeah. not replaceable mm-hmm. is at home. Yeah. Yeah, and, and but basically you're not replaceable as well for yourself, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Because in the end of the day, the moments that you have with your... Just, just with your own self, basically, nobody can replace that for you. Uh, yeah. to be honest and if you feel yeah if you feel just generally happy or you don't even if you have to feel happy sometimes you just have to feel you serene yeah right <laughs> uh, exactly and feel you that's that's that that is, that is a very priceless thing to happen yeah well okay we had several elements of this conversation which are piling up uh under the human rights umbrella mm-hmm. so we we spoke about health and mental health we spoke about well-being we spoke about work and how it it relates and how the relationship between humans and work is changing and i want to maybe have a a larger question regarding human rights and your thoughts Mm -hmm. on human rights Mm -hmm. as a as a political agenda issue Mm -hmm. uh everyone is talking about the um european elections coming in less than three months Mm -hmm. and everyone prognosing that the right wing will have uh more seats uh, than than what's yeah. uh, now in in many countries. I know that you're considering to run uh, mm-hmm. for the European Parliament, and I'm interested to hear what 
why first of yeah. all why would you want to do that yes why, in this why would i want to do it to myself as well to my well-being yeah, yeah 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 and and then maybe to to share if if you decide to go what will mm-hmm. you focus on yes so i've 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 been in and supporting the uh, the socialist movement in in spain uh i'm a member of PSOE, the socialist party and in spain but generally i've been um partnering up and really getting engaged with the whole socialist democrat but not just primarily socialist democrat political mm-hmm. family at the eu level but with generally with the progressive uh movements uh at uh, at political level because i think even with even if you have slightly different sort of political colors in that sphere the word progressive is the one that that yeah. uh, unites you and and makes it possible to see a human being at the end of your politics um so i was for example i i was a i was a candidate in the municipal elections in spain on the 28th of may last year um they didn't go uh exactly the the the, the way that we as a party political party uh were hoping to go um um back then but however i have been very open with 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 some some of the some of the sort of maybe decision makers in pesoe that it would be I would be more than um, willing to support uh, that political movement and the wider European socialist democratic, but also progressive family, if 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 they wanted to include me on the on the on the Spanish list for PSOE for the upcoming elections. Now, what I'm saying is I'm not Spanish. I have a name and surname that certainly doesn't <laughs> sound Spanish. I have the most Polish name. <laughs> exactly. But I am I am a, an EU citizen. I have yeah. hold a Polish passport and I reside in Spain. I paid my taxes in Spain. Um so by simply just on the technicality, I am eligible to be um mm-hmm. to be uh, a candidate to represent uh, the country in which I reside. Um and what I would be, where I'm coming from, is precisely this ex- exposure, I guess, and experience in the EU bubble. Let's call it this way. Yeah. Um, more than 15 years here, really understanding how how Brussels works uh, in terms of the institutional um, machinations, the operations that happen here. So I wouldn't sort of, you know, I'm I'm a per- I probably know it very well as well, and I mm-hmm. um, and this is where I could be offering the support. But really, for me, the key thing is uh, to bring in the views and the experiences of the civil society sector into politics. So your your agenda will there will be a spot for human rights in, in your absolutely. Agenda. It's human okay. socio economic human rights inclusion with a very big focus on. Something that basically, when I was exposed to uh, these pursuits of social justice, by pursuing social justice, when I was the president of Social Platform, when I continue now as Secretary General of Volunt Europe as well, is absolutely the focus on 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 social justice. And I guess you know because we 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 talk a lot about um, um, leaving nobody behind. Yes, but then I try I always say, you know, but yeah, what does it mean to leave no one behind? And for the way I would explain it is basically leaving nobody behind is making sure that people are not just surviving. Is yeah. that we are creating, uh, we are doing our best to create opportunities where people are, where people are thriving. Mm. Because there's a huge difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a massive difference between just surviving uh, and and thriving. And this is exactly the. This is this is something that I. Um, that I see myself really committed to um, very much, and this is where I think the you know when you when we have these uh, s- these worries around how the how the European Parliament will look like after after the June elections in terms mm. of more mm, more right wing more extreme right wing representation as well um, in it. This is where we then have to stand stand up together really to make mm-hmm. sure that. Because as, as I mentioned, it, you know, when I was talking about language, trying to find the scapegoats is extremely easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think then we will have to be stronger together in terms of the progressive movements, but have as many people from many different backgrounds uh, on board working together to make sure that the rights, the human rights that we mm-hmm. have achieved, whether it's for LGBTQI people. Or for people with, I don't know, for with 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 disabilities, or people who have a migrant background, that these rights are not dismantled, 
because it's very easy to unpick yeah. unpick these things. Um, and these rides have been fought for and took a lot of time as well and sweat. Um, but really, it's not to basically not to. We have this saying in Polish, and I'm sure there's a Bulgarian version. Not to sit on your laurels, right? Can you, you know? say it in Polish? Mm, nie, nie na laurach. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You'd understand with, with yeah. that. Nostari, nostari wavri. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you know, we've done. Yeah. I've done my work now. Done. You know, done. Exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, that that work doesn't doesn't finish. The safeguarding part of it all. I think it's where we. Maybe we we trusted ourselves too much that the job is done. Yeah. Because I think that with I I'll be very honest. I hear the right wing prognosis. I I'm not scared mm. about it because yeah. I've seen several parliaments, several national elections in different countries, many municipal elections. Yeah. When right right wingers are very strong during campaigns. Yeah. Once they arrived at the actual spot. Yeah. I think that they kind of realize that it's not going to happen in, in the way that, mm. I mean, if they have, I don't know, 80%, yeah, it will happen, but most likely 10, 15%, I can live with that because yeah. I know that one, and this is, we have to as well be very open. This is part of society which exists and we cannot just of course, say, because, yes. we don't like you get yeah. out yeah. where to, to get out where yeah. on Mars, mm -hmm. they, they will be here and we have to learn yeah. to work together somehow. And my experience, I've worked several times with right wingers because I had to. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, I was part of a um, social organization back at home, and we needed to work with the city council. And, mm -hmm. and there are people from the right wing party. So what do you do? You don't talk to them. No, you have to talk to them yeah. exactly because you disagree and you have to pick up your very social left agenda and try to meet somewhere. And we, I, I, it's very bad, but we work great with them. Mm -hmm. I despise everything else that they did. Mm -hmm. But when it came to uh, this thing that we needed to do together, we managed to convince them. They didn't have any arguments opposing that, so mm -hmm. they finally voted pro. It was about a, a plot for a social service uh, therapy center mm -hmm. for children. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the right-wingers... Again, I don't want to offend anyone. I'm not sure they are truly right wingers. Mm -hmm. I think that they like the populist yeah. sound about it, but they also are are mothers and fathers. Of course, yes, they're my brothers mother. and yeah. sisters. And I yeah. don't really believe that they believe a lot yeah. of the things that they're saying. No, it's it's very true. And I think yeah, I think um, there is a fallacy as well in approaching. Also, you know, language comes up again in our conversation. Um, there's a, a sort of Almost like defeatism. If we if if we say, "Oh, I'm really worried about how the the elections will go," because that sent that idea of, "Oh, I'm really worried. I'm really scared." That already creates a lot of yeah. negative feeling, basically, and an insecurity. And actually, no, it's another way of approaching the way I'm. I've been saying that. Okay, we might have new challenges, yeah. or these challenges might be sort of more mm, pressing. But we're there. We're there, basically, ready to counter them and yeah. work with it. So you sort of take things on the, it's my, my sort of British upbringing, you know, take it on the chin, you know, and, 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 and get on with it. But jokes aside, this is the way to, to, to also approach it. And of course, engaging in dialogue, uh, and you have to at least try engaging in dialogue try, because yeah. sometimes, of course, sometimes there are things that you will never be able to, you start a dialogue, it'll f a break down and you won't be able to find any consensus whatsoever, but yes, never approach. Yeah. Don't have the sort of moral stand standpoint. Mm. Okay. I'm so much you know, better because I'm yeah. so much more open-minded. I will not talk to you. No, that's, that's actually, that's, that's not the way to, to, to go. I've done that. Yeah. I've done that when I was younger uh, mm -hmm. to, in many different situations. Yeah. And I think that that, that's a lot, a lot of us. Yes. We're yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. But just yeah. realize that that's not, that's not leading you anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's not leading to progress. That's not leading to a conversation that exactly leads to an end of a conversation and, and walls. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Well, speaking about human rights, I don't want to forget mentioning, I told you already about this amazing board mm -hmm. game. Uh, it's, uh, created by, uh, NGO back in Sofia in Bulgaria. Okay. And, uh, what you do is you try to save the world, which is becoming more and more relevant okay. <laughs> in the times we live in. The game is called Barabar and, mm -hmm. uh, you choose different characters. You find different challenges like, Giant spider invasion, zombie apocalypse. Okay. And you have 70 characters from which you choose. Yeah, pick one. I'll be interested to see which one you pick. Okay, just just, <laughs> just randomly, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So. Okay. Who do you have? A Louis Pasteur. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I have Dr. Jane Goodwall. So she's an environmentalist and mm -hmm. you can see. So the blue are entrepreneurs and inventors. The green are environmentalists. Okay. We have artists. We have we have politicians. Under, we yeah. have so many people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you combine <clears throat> powers with the different characters and you find whoever yeah. and whatever you need to fight. And it's great for team buildings. It's great for family nights because you can introduce your children uh, or your team to different role mm -hmm. models and characters. And at the end of the day, it's fun. And yeah. by purchasing that from www.barabar.eu, you support a nice social NGO. Super. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, shout out to Barabar. And um, going back to human rights, I, I want to ask you, is there a formula for mainstreaming human rights mm -hmm. in politics? Have you invented one that you want to share? <laughs> I, no, it's very difficult. No, I wouldn't want to say that I've invented anything myself. You know, um, <laughs> a lot of you know, a lot of I would say achievements which make a which do create a difference are done because you're working together with others. Mm -hmm. So what you might have maybe a set of ideas that you have contributed with, but really it it, it brings a group. Uh, to to really make a change sometimes uh, happen, or at least it has been the case in in what I've been uh, pursuing myself. I would say that there is a level of believing in the fact that you can you can achieve a change and make a positive change as well, <clears throat> and perseverance. Yes, it's it's a very important um, element to throw into the mix. As I mentioned to you, I am also in, engaged in the Council of Europe in the Conference of NGOs. And I think um, one example of where it uh, I could give where it happened in the Council of Europe was after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, how much of a um, um, urgency we felt in the Council of Europe to proceed as rapidly as possible to uh, to kick Russia out as a member state. Uh, mm -hmm. from the from the from the institution from the Council of Europe as an institution and it wasn't a suspension it was basically a removal of a member mm -hmm. which has not happened I mean Belarus has been suspended from from the Council of Europe for, for many years but an expulsion of a member did not happen and really how quickly that was worked and it was worked by everybody um all the different pillars and 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 let's say the you know the the constellations the movements with it within the Council of Europe uh, that that required a lot of cooperation, a lot of courage, and a lot of um, confidence that this will happen because that sends a strong message. Really, mm -hmm. at, as an in, at an institutional level, it really does send, send a strong message. Of course, then there are issues. What happens with, for example, because Council of Europe is very much also linked with civil society, mm -hmm. right? Not that uh, much with exactly. Yeah. It, it has a hugely powerful sort of council of ministers, but it also has got a conference yeah. of NGOs, not very well resourced at all because it receives hardly any money. It's not actually a formal pillar of the council of Europe, but it exists there. It's pressing for, mm -hmm. uh, for human rights. It had a big, for example, most recently the human rights commissioner with the, who uh, was uh, elected in the Council of Europe, who's Michael O'Flaherty, the former director of fundamental rights agency mm -hmm. as well. Actually, we this time, as I'm on the standing committee of the of the of the conference of NGOs, we actually interviewed informally the three candidates as well, and I really see that a lot of positive change is happening with the power that the conference of NGOs is wielding. Right, but basically, what I'm what I'm saying is, if you make a this take a decision, such as the expulsion of Russia as a as a member member of of the Council of Europe, it does also mean you know what happens with legitimate NGOs, Russian NGOs, yeah. that like you talked about, you know, the, the rug being pulled from underneath their, um, their, 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 their feet, um, that basically you have to then continue making sure that you work, you don't leave them, just yeah. uh, be, leave them on their own. So the work of human rights defenders are so vital as well, human rights mm -hmm. defenders organizations and making sure that there is the, you know, you offer as much as it's complicated and difficult and challenging. Um, there are consequences, exactly. There are consequences yeah. of making a big decision like that, um, like which happened at the level of Council of Europe. 
Well, it happens, but you have to, you know, they, they have to happen. And then I guess uh, if we stick with the, with the, with the theme as well, um, you know, the EU was applying, uh, was working on, on sanctions mm -hmm. against, um, against, uh, against Putin basically and, and his, and his, and his regime. But look how easy it has been to circumvent sanctions as well. So, uh, going beyond, I guess, you know, going beyond the really trying to, if you really want to achieve something, it's trying to close the loopholes as well mm -hmm. and going beyond the, really the, the sort of individual, now individualistic, I mean, more sort of national, um, mm -hmm. national, for, for example, interests that, uh, stay in power, that stay in place. Mm -hmm. The, the fact that it's very, <clears throat> You know, we've had one member say that has been holding the the rest of the EU ransom when it came to uh, to having decisions on on support of aid to Ukraine, mm. which finally was you know was 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 overcome. But yes, we I think we need to get we need to as 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 an as an institution there needs to be a bigger. We always have to think about the bigger picture. That basically, you know, we're not. I would say like we're nobody is free until everybody is free. Mm -hmm. If we have this approach and also if, if the political powers also have this understanding that, uh, as long as, you know, there's injustice to, to, to people, to humans, to the environment, to, um, uh, happening around the world. And basically we're not, we're not free, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, we're free in our bubbles, uh, in our comforts. We're free in our but, bubbles, yeah. but we don't mm. maybe realize how much closer our bubbles are mm -hmm. as never in history before yeah and i think that that's it's difficult for me to to not talk in everything that you said for example about what's happening in gaza because mm -hmm. it's uh it, it's such a tragedy both what's happening in ukraine but there's also gaza there's sudan there's there's so mm -hmm. many places where human rights, not, not human rights, peace, mm -hmm. human rights comes after, unfortunately, because yeah. there is no human rights during war, during conflict, yeah. everything is, mm -hmm. is forgotten. And there is a crisis in leadership in different parts of the world. And somehow we need to keep on reminding what our common ground is, that mm. it is human rights. And then if we unfortunately end up with leaders, for example, such as Trump, which most likely I don't know. Like, let's let's not insinuate with fear. But if we have somebody like Trump and somebody like like, like Orban mm -hmm. uh, in the different continents, and somebody like Putin in Asia, that's just really going back mm -hmm. to where we were 70, 80 years yeah. ago. Yeah. And that is what I think. It's far more scary than having a couple of right wing idiots in the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. Like the whole crisis of leadership. Uh, there's there's something wrong with it. And I yeah. think that um, the more people are interested in politics, the more they go and dig deeper, the more they, they will realize that that's not what they want. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and also men, just give it a break. You know, you, you don't have to be in power, you know. There's... Uh, yeah. And Good that it's yeah. coming from you this time. Yeah. Mainly it's women yeah. sitting on yeah. that spot. Yeah. No, but I, I, I'm, a bit, I'm, I'm also like I see, you know, it's really there's very few women who are these sort of power crazy um, yeah. uh, people who are pursuing absolutely horrendous sort of uh, ways of running, uh, running governments as well. Yeah, there was one one great example in this event that I. I just had last week in Sofia. So I was going through the European Women's Lobby Manifesto mm -hmm. for women and representation. And there is a manifesto towards the European Parliament yeah. candidates. I will, if you go and run, I will send it to you so you can, <laughs> you can have a look. But there were a couple of great examples of like the most sexist things said to uh, women who are running for office in different uh, dimensions. So... In 2007, in the presidential debate in France, uh, the male uh, candidate said to the female candidate, but who will be taking after your kids if you right. go? Yeah. Uh -huh. Then there was one more, which I truly loved. I'm not quoting it correctly, but it was so. The Australian prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, met the Finnish prime minister, Sanna Marin, to uh -huh. one prime minister go in both places. Yeah. And one of the leading journalists questioned during the press conference were, 
it's so great that you met up. You must have so much in common to oh, talk wow. about. Yeah. It's like <laughs> they're gossiping about lipsticks. I don't yeah. know, but it's it's very weird how we perceive women in mm -hmm. political power very differently mm -hmm. from from men. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, let's have more women. Yes, exactly. You see, like maybe I, you know, somebody legitimately could look at the picture that was taken of me in the social summit in Porto when I was with Macron, you know, maybe I was talking to him about, you know, the, the color of the tie that he likes to wear, you know, yes. and, and, and I do as well. So yeah. let's just I'm box sure it that's... up like that. <laughs> Okay. Well, look, it's been it's been wonderful talking to you. I always have Thank you, two Maya. very short questions for for closing. Okay. The first one is uh what makes you hopeful for the future? Um I think what makes me hopeful for the future is being able to see the um the potential in in, in I would say in young people that I'm surrounded by in my current um, areas of work. So um, a big focus, for example, right now on the on what I mentioned before, water being uh, approaching water, fresh water as a human rights, uh, as, a, as a human rights um, for all of us. But also the now that I see that a lot of young people are changing their climate stress their eco anxiety into positive actions and this mm -hmm. has been happening a lot around us as well and uh the 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 sort of the 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 movements of young people which then are joined by people of other ages as well are flourishing are growing as well so i think that there is there will be um there, there is hope in that i don't agree with the fact that young people are just not interested maybe yeah, you know i think I think young people are interested in their future in politics. They're just not interested in that sort of old fashioned way that it's been approached the as approach, well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. So that's where I find, that's where I find hope. Um, yes. And I find hope as well in the future by the, in the fact that I'm able to speak to you also on a very personal level, I'm able to speak to you very openly and not sort of fear for uh, maybe my, you know, how things will impact on my career on, or, how people will maybe view me because I have shared some very personal things about me and about the problems that I've been facing as well. And I had to sort of work on uh, as well. So that's a big, big, big hope for the future as well, because these, you know, even a few years back, I wouldn't have been in a position of feeling comfortable to, to talk about that, uh, the way I have been speaking to you about that. Thank you. And then organically we go to the last question, which is what makes you happy? Um, what makes me happy is exactly when I managed to find that um, blissful separation of work and go into my well-being, um, seeing my cat. Uh, that, uh, my What's cat. the name of your cat? Uh, Coco. Coco, yeah. okay. Yes. Coco lives in Spain. And I don't see him, we don't see him that much, uh, when obviously when we're not there. Um, so going back now on, uh, on Saturday... Yes, but uh, beyond that, I think it's uh, being surrounded by people who um, who love me and support me, and equally me being able to uh, offer the same to to others. I think that there's happiness, but also then there's happiness of just um, sitting down on my own sometimes and um, reading a really good book. Uh, that makes me happy too. I think there's different levels of happiness in the, for or different sort of elements which create this happy bubble. We talked about bubbles mm -hmm. a lot today um, and being able to find that mm, space for yourself. And I think understanding that happiness does not always have to be um, involved, uh, that of course others play a big role in, in you being happy, but sometimes also, and I, I think this is where I what I understood much more is that basically the happiness as well begins with you being um, fair to yourself, kind to yourself, um, and also realizing that basically you are in the end, you are a very important thing to your own self. Yeah. If, I'm, if, 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 if all of this makes sense to you, um, then yes, you are finding a good spot for yourself. That's so important to be kind to yourself mm -hmm. and to understand yourself and your emotions. The last quote that really stuck with me on that was that if you you have to talk to yourself 
as if you're talking to a child that you love. Mm -hmm. And if your conversation with this child is evil, imagine that social services would come and take you away. (laughs) Exactly. I was like, oh, that hits home, okay. I will never talk to a child the way I've spoken to myself in Mm. in certain situations. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, on that note, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maya. It was so nice to to talk to you. Super, I so enjoyed it. Thank you for having me as well and for for the time that we've been able to share. Thank you for for being so open and thank you for all of the work you've been doing because it's it's impressive the amount of things that you've initiated and you've been part of. And it's great that I was also part of that for a while. Yes, yes, exactly. Thanks, Maya. Thank you. Thank you for for listening and for being with us. Be kind. Hug your hug your dog or your cat or mm-hmm. whatever you you have around, and uh, speak to yourself with kindness and love because you deserve it. Thank you very much. See you next week.